too many of your secrets on all the research you've done, Jane. Would you be able to, to give our listeners a, a little bit of a, an insight to how you can actually pick a property that's got renovation potential? Because sure. like there's, there's obviously ones that are duds and ones that are winners. Like how do you spot them? Uh, look, you know, I've been giving away my information for 20 years with the hope that people use it. So I'm more than happy to give you all the secret clause. Um, it's because it really just comes down to the properties with renovation potential. Just because a property looks like it needs some love and renovation does not mean that it deserves it to be able to justify it to be done profitably. And that's the underlying assumption. So, you know, I'll, I'll walk into properties and see people um, doing inspections and they're like, shit this brown bathroom out. Wow, we could do da 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 And the reality is it comes, you have to get a 10,000 foot view. So if we look at the 10,000 foot view, we're not looking at the property, we're not looking at the street, we're looking at the suburb and then we're looking at the city. So we're looking at the growth potential of the city. So, you know, first of all, population movements. So you're looking at, you know, where are people going to be moving and where the jobs created that kind of big economic uh, decision making and we know east coast australia is predominantly where most people live we know that the biggest cities are the ones all the satellite cities that feed those cities are the ones that have had the best growth we get that we know houses outperform units so if we start with that assumption we get and get to the suburb level and for, to renovate you have to have a suburb that has pricing disparity which means just the difference in pricing between the renovated and unrenovated properties yeah. so i'm always looking at suburbs and going What's the unrenovated property selling for? What are the renovated properties selling for? And then I'm looking at a very simple calculation. So what's the cost of buying? What's the cost of the renovation? What's the cost of me holding it, which is a function of interest rates and time? And then what's the profit I want to make? Now, if all of those numbers add up to a number that is less than what the renovated comparable properties are selling for, winner, winner, chicken dinner, that's the suburb, and that's where I start. And then I get down to... For me, because I want to hold my properties, I use the census data and, you know, it's a, it, it did take me like 18 calls and emails with census to work out how to get this, but, you know, in a five-minute tutorial, I, I can show people how to work out what streets the renters want to live in. So I first, then I overlay my filters. So I have a number of filters. I have about 18 different filters to minimize my risk. One is I have to have at least 28 to 30 percent renters so i need to have demand there i have to have a vacancy rate of less than three percent and i have to have more than 60 sales a year those three basic things allow me to just de-risk that suburb as well so i'm pricing disparity for renovation then de-risk it and you know so i'm looking at the renovation potential of the trident strategy then i'm looking at the opportunity for growth now growth for me is about the ripple effect so i'm always looking at well, what's the next suburbs that are going to take off? And I you know, uh, happily stole with her permission Ms. Nadine Simmons' dot mapping technique, which is essentially looking at the last 10-year growth, putting a legend together and dotting the cities that you're interested in and looking where those ripples are. And you know, being a tech person, I've obviously you know, Google, dot, <laughs> Google dotted that a lot quicker than the process most people do by hand. But finding out what the ripple suburbs are. So if I've got a, a suburb that's set for growth, I've got a suburb with pricing disparity and then I've got the calculation that works of knowing what streets to buy. Then I look at the typical property, which is once again a low risk assessment, which census tells you it's a three bedroom house and you know the typical block might be five to eight hundred square meters. Because if I have to sell quickly through death, divorce, debt, whatever, or if I have to sell in the long term, I want to sell to the biggest market. So I don't want to have the one bedroom unit where everyone's got a three bedroom house. I want the three bedroom house, typical property. And then I would get to work finding the typical property. So it, it's 10,000 steps, foot view all the way down. If, if you've been listening to all of the podcasts and you're listening to this one right now, I can't help but think that you'd be noticing the same common thing that I'm noticing right now is scarcity. Scarcity yep. is the big thing that always jumps out with every professional we talk to. Supply and demand. Yeah, it just it totally makes sense. Absolutely. And, and it, you know, I remember speaking to this lady at a party and she was saying, we're about to buy our next investment property. We've got the first one wrong. I'm like, what, what went wrong? And she's like, well, you know, based in Melbourne, she said, we bought in Point Cook this investment property. We have this beautiful home in Kew, um, but, you know, we bought a house and land package. It was the same as every other one. 
where they kept developing, they kept having the new properties, the tenants kept moving to the new properties, they had long vacancies. In the end, to be financially viable, we had to move from our beautiful home in Kew to this little house out in Point Cook and commute every day. We had to drive the kids back and forth to their private school to do their violin lessons. We learned our lesson. Now we're going to buy an inner city unit. I'm like, you've got the same mistake. You've got, you know, there's a huge amount of properties of that type. There's nothing distinguishing it. You can't add value or make yours different. You know, the supply and demand factor is here. It's actually the same. You think you've done the right thing from going out of town to in town, from going a house to a unit. You've actually just replicated the same mistake you made in the beginning. So they were thinking that the mistake was locality, where you were explaining to them that it wasn't, like, whilst that definitely had a part of it, but it was more about the scarcity. And there's going to be a surplus yeah, it's demand. Supply. It's yeah. Supply. Yeah. Exactly. And trying to add something different to your property to make it one that stands out when there's two similar properties up for rent in the area. I want people to walk into mine and go, oh, polished floorboards. Oh, I've got some security. Oh, look, there's Foxtel. You know, whatever it is. Mm. But just for things that are just a little bit better. I'm not talking about TVs in the bathroom. I'm just talking about just a little bit of forethought of what people might want. Built-in wardrobe. Do you ever use swimming pools? No. No, didn't think so. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, in Queensland, I can see how there's some interest. But, I mean, Jack, you probably see this all the time. People add a $100,000 swimming pool and the yeah, value of the property yeah. goes up by what, 20 grand? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm renovating my first uh, pool house at the moment. And, and oh I my goodness. only got it because all the numbers stacked up in every other way. Otherwise, I yep. never would have bought one. But when I got the, the pool guy around, like, great guy and everything, but he kept talking about how much they add value and they're amazing. I'm just mm. thinking that they really don't. Like, I understand no. he's trying to sell pools, but yeah. Um, I've got to tell you, the only pool house I'd be interested in written with one that has, like, the, the snooker stick associated with it. Oh, oh, pool table. Yeah, pool ta- <laughs> I was wondering what you meant then, but they... Yeah. <laughs> All right, so you've talked us through selecting a good property to renovate. Is there, are there any common mistakes that you see novice renovators or flippers make? Is there like a, a trend that you see clients that you deal with kind of making mistakes on a regular basis? Like putting pools in? Or buying, yeah. buying houses um, with pools? Look, it's just some really simple ones. They buy the wrong property. They renovate to their own taste. They overcapitalize. They don't treat it like a business. You know, and I think, you know, I I remember speaking to one couple who's saying, we're about to go into the flipping business, we're we're giving up our jobs, we've always made money on our homes, we're very good at this. And I said, just send me the details on your home, you know, purchase price, what you spend on the renovation, what you sold them for. And I came back and showed them the capital growth in those areas whilst they held those properties was the equivalent to the value that had been added added that they'd sold their property for. They'd made nothing out of the renovation. They were about to give up their jobs and start flipping. So I think it's a numbers um, game in the sense that it's not a game, but you need to actually understand that it is a business and you need to be able to make sure it works for you. So don't overcapitalize, buy the right property, don't, don't um, renovate to your own taste and buy what people want. The thing, people that flip don't consider damp duty. That does my head in. Mm. So. Yeah, or oh, capital gains tax. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and they're, and they're two very big uh, entry and exit costs mm. there. It's It's mm. one of those things that if you don't, put it into the numbers in the beginning, you can end up thinking that you've just made a whole lot of money and really you've either broken even or sometimes even lost money, awesome. I've seen. Yeah. And, you know, they're trying to do it in the same market. The market might move, but then, you know, they get, then they have to, they get caught up in the marketing plans that the agents talk to them about or they get caught up with, oh, well, then I have to spend five grand staging the property. All good spends, you know, they're going to make the money, but they're things they haven't considered in the beginning and that number just comes off your profit. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And and looking at it as a, like you said, looking at as the numbers actually tell you the truth and it's a business, it, it can't be done as a, well, this is really pretty, so I'm going to make money. Mm-hmm. You've, you've just got to look at the facts and the figures. And I remember speaking to a developer not that long ago and he was talking about um, some developers are now taking on projects with like 8% profit margins. And it's just, mm-hmm. I don't understand how they do it because all mm-hmm. that has to happen is all of a sudden your, your building costs go up by 4% and mm-hmm. maybe your sales cost is going to go down by 3 or 4% and you've just done the whole thing for nothing. And, and exactly. those are two very easy movements to happen as well. I remember, you know, when um, I used to talk to the banks about, you know, the developers kind of finance, you know, Five years ago, they were looking at like 25%. Mm. And they dropped it down to 18, 20. So 8% is, you know, they wouldn't be able to get funds for it. They'd have to fund that themselves. Yeah, I, I think he was referring to more uh, like mum and dad kind of uh, one into mm. two, not not big scale. Mm. We're not talking about doing apartment buildings or anything like that. You'd like to think you know what you're doing if you're 
your projects are that big. But they were the numbers for townhouses, like three to four townhouses. That was what the banks were expecting in return. Yeah, wow. Yeah, okay. All right, Jane. So putting your mortgage broker hat on, with the, mm. the Royal Commission into Banking Misconduct in 2019, there was a real threat to the mortgage broker industry. Now, we know that mortgage brokers are accountable for approximately 60% of the loans that kind of go through in Australia. Mm. What changes? 